次は私たちの番だから神隠しにあった5人が順番やめてよここにきっと何かあるはず。With the start of chapter 2, we found ourselves now under the control of Masaki, and almost immediately, we're presented with our own camera obscura, along with some explanatory notes from Dr. Asso. Seems that the camera obscura we're now in ownership of is something of a prototype that he entrusted to his own family, and I think this is something of a revelation, as we didn't know at the start of the game that Masaki was part of the Asso bloodline. And even though we know from chapter 1 what has happened to Madoka, Masaki as of right now does not because we are a little bit behind in the timeline, so we're going to have to just look around a bit and see if we can't find some clues. And almost immediately we are presented with something of an auditory clue that seems to be coming from the nurse's office. Now, there are a number of new items to pick up in here, but what is drawing our attention most is this intercom system in the back here. The voice of Madoka seems to be calling us to room 203. But the problem is that we are currently blocked from getting to the patient's wing due to this four digit code that we currently do not have. So maybe some of the new items that are waiting for us here in the nurse's office will elucidate where we can possibly get that code. Might as well go ahead and start picking up items. First item is just a few blue crystals, still not as many as we need right now. We also find a document that will list out the, f the room assignments on the second floor here. We find Room 203 seemingly, seemingly was Monica's room at some point. We also get a little bit of a rundown in regards to some of the other room assignments. It does kind of elucidate some of the backstories regarding some of the people in the rooms. We've already 
gotten an impression that something like a hanging might have happened in one. Also here we find Kazuto Amaki, who was the young boy that stole the mask in Chapter 1. He did have a stealing habit. And most oddly of all, we find in Rune 207, Ayako, a very aggressive young child. Still, though, even though this, that does give us some backstory, that still doesn't really tell us how we're going to be able to get into that wing. Which is why we have this nurse's log. Seems that the young children of the ward have been playing a little game amongst themselves to figure out the passcode to get into the ward. And they seem to leave hints around for other children to find, something like a hide-and-seek type game. So we probably need to keep, keep an eye open for any young children that might be running around to see if they can't give us some clues. I'm sure it'll be much like the hide-and-seek game from Fatal Frame 1, or at least I hope it isn't. Also here we get a brand new function for our camera for Fatal Frame 4. If we go ahead and take a quick look at our camera here, it'll give us a short description as to what the evade function does. It's pretty self-explanatory, but if we happen to shake the Wii mode at just the right time, we can fully 100% dodge a ghost attack. Now this is very useful in the game. This will pretty much negate most damage in the game outside of projectiles, but as we've been able to see, most ghosts will attack via trying to touch us, so that's useful. Also, some of my doll sense is tingling because hidden away down here under the desk. And we have another Hazuki doll. But with that, I think it's trying to time to find if we can't find some children that might lead us to this password game that we were told about before. Also, we can take a quick vanishing shot of that one troublesome ghost that we uh, we had a little fight with in the previous chapter. Seems that might, he might have been visiting someone in the ward we're trying to get to. But we have a number of ways we can go right now, but I, I still feel that the hall, the main hall here, is probably our best destination. And there are some troubling vanishing ghosts that we need to try to capture as we head downstairs. <laughs> You have to be super quick though, because after we take the shot of these initial two, you have to immediately pop out of the camera, run downstairs, and turn to your right as quickly as possible because you have only a second, only a second to capture those two that are standing next to the door underneath the storage room under the stairs. It's very, very tight in regards to the timing for that, and I... I do apologize for missing it by a half second there, but it, it's it's okay. At least, at least we now have the clue as to where we need to go next. Still, I was pretty sure that whenever we visited this room beforehand, we had cleared out pretty much anything of interest in this small storage area. But we can see that our filament is lighting up just a little bit, and it, it does appear that there is a new item waiting for us. And it's a crudely drawn picture by a child. Somehow Masaki is able to infer that that is supposed to look like a clock. And we haven't seen too many clocks around the building so far. So it shouldn't be too hard to limit down where we need to go. Also, on on top of this little circuit breaker we messed with in Chapter 1, we find a few more blue crystals. But 
but the good news is that the clock we need to get to is not too terribly far away. In fact, as we hit the main reception area here, we start to hear the odd chiming of that nearby grandfather clock. Pretty, pretty ornate looking piece of furniture. And oddly enough, instead of just having numbers, the clock is split up into phases of the moon, which goes into the rituals and ideology of the island. More importantly though, we, Masaki notices that at the base of the camera there seems to be some scratchings. And also that our camera is now reacting to the, the grandfather clock here. So if we take a quick look downwards and take a quick snapshot. It gives us the solution to the password game. Pretty simple puzzle all around, but we're... We're still pretty early into the game. But before we head up and enter that password, there are a few items waiting down here for us to pick up, so we might as well go ahead and get those. Such as a few more red crystals. And you want to be careful when heading by the double doors here at the front as we get a quick vanishing ghost. Not sure if that's the same ghost we've seen uh, pressing against the glass in other places, but could very well be. Also, where we found the brochure previously, we now find a referral notice for a new patient. The aforementioned Ayako in room 207, who apparently was specifically recommended to be inferred at this ward for some reason or another. I'm sure we'll find out later. Also, my doll sense is tingling just a little bit more. Because hidden under the front desk here is another doll. We're making pretty good headway on finding as many of these dolls as possible, but with all that out of the way, we're going to go ahead and head back up to the nurse's office and see if we can't make our way slowly but surely to Marika. So it may seem simple enough to enter in the door code here, but for some reason or another, Tecmo decided that we should have to twist the Wiimote, which, honestly, I'm still getting a bit used to the Wiimote controls, and I was pretty sure I was turning in the correct direction, but uh, something must have been messing up with the Wiimote, as I seem to not get the correct twisting motion in in motion I suppose but it's not it's not too difficult to punch in this four digit code
though I guess that vanishing ghost nurse was not all that happy with the fact that we unlocked the ward. But she is pretty much the exact same fight as we had at the start of chapter 1. And it's honestly a bit more easier now that we have an indication for the fatal frame opportunity. Though you may have noticed that the viewfinder for Misaki's camera is noticeably different than um, the other camera obscura that we currently have. And I feel that's just a nice little touch on the on the design side that they they actually went out of their way to carry over the similar idea from Fatal Frame 3 where each individual camera had its own each individual viewfinder. Overall though, it doesn't have any kind of real gameplay differences. It seems to charge up the exact same, so it's it's more or less just an aesthetic difference. find ourselves in the same creepy hallway as before, but we have more definite destination this time around. Which would be that door, but our camera seems to be reacting to something else nearby. And on the ground here we find a letter that wasn't present before next to this busted down doorway. And in it we find a note that gives us a little bit of backstory on a character we're never really going to get more story about. It just goes into more about this loss of being that we have seen kind of represented in regards to Madoka and her breakdown regarding her past, her face, and things like that. This female patient seemed to have a similar outcome and decided that instead of losing herself and all the memories of her dead family, she would rather take her own life and hopefully retain those memories in, in the afterlife. We also get one of the odd opportunities where we get a vanishing, well, not so much a vanishing ghost, but more of a hidden ghost. We don't get too many of these opportunities, but we do get a few thousand points just for doing that. Also, while we hear the cries of Monica, we seem to hear another voice as well in the room with her. Sadly, we're not able to enter the room just yet. It seems the door is locked. Seems the locked door is the least of our concerns right now as we are assaulted with a returning ghost and a brand new ghost, but most importantly this is the first difficult enemy encounter of the game where we have to deal with two ghosts simultaneously in a very small area. The only thing that makes this fight relatively easy is the fact that even though that other ghost seems new, actually has the exact same attack pattern as the ghost we've already met. and. If you can get the fatal frames down, you can manage to get both at the same time, which along with their low HP pools means you can take them out pretty quickly as long as you don't get flanked by them. But with all that out of the way, it looks like our filament is reacting to something on Madoka's door here. Hopefully it will be some hint as to how we can get inside. What's revealed is a pretty familiar room. It looks like the library down in the first floor museum. So I guess that is going to be our next destination. 
But while we are up in this area, there are a few quick things that I might have missed in the previous chapter. First one is a little bit down where we found the alarm function. On one of these shelves here is a naughty little doll trying to hide from us. Really, it's not easy to miss that one. It's not really that hidden. But there is one that is a little bit harder to spot waiting in Kazuto's room. Now, obviously, his room is filled with all types of debris and bric-a-brac, so it's very easy to miss this doll, especially considering that I guess the young boy wasn't too happy with the doll and, for some reason, decided to bury it inside of a potted plant. It's completely understandable, considering how creepy this doll is overall. But that's all we need to do up here, so we're going to go ahead and head back down to the first floor and try to enter the museum. You do want to be careful because there's this tricky vanishing ghost at the top of the stairs that is a seemingly new figure to us. That young girl doesn't seem like anyone we've met so far. I'm sure it'll I'm sure it'll come to light as to who that is in a little bit, but it shouldn't impede our destination, which is the archive room. And as there are no new items to pick up in the main museum area here, we're going to go ahead and head straight into the library, which thankfully this time around is not locked to us. Also, you may notice this time around there isn't the noticeable slowdown from Chapter 1, and I think it's mostly due to the lack of physics objects with the books themselves. But, we find a brand new lens here on the shelf here, and if we go ahead and look at our camera setup, the first thing you might notice is the fact that we only have one power lens, and that's because the power lenses don't carry over between characters, so even though Ruka's camera has the blast lens, currently Masaki does not have that. She only has the pressure lens, which, much like the previous Fatal Frame games, only causes a temporary pushback to the ghosts, and all in all, that, that never is something useful to me, so... So we get a few more red crystals, which I could spend on pressure, but it's honestly a power lens I'll never find a use for, so... But we get another return visit from this exceptionally eccentric ghost here. We had so much trouble with in the previous chapter, but... I think this time around I've gotten down his pattern a little bit better. Still, there is 
a little bit of difficulty just in regards to the bookshelves here. They they do cause some targeting troubles whenever you're trying to fight something. But the good news is, this time around, this ghost didn't feel the need to wildly rush at us, which in this room would, tr would spell really big trouble. So he was a lot easier to deal with. But with him out of the way, we can now get the item that we came here for. Even though I quickly skip over it, it is a brand new key, which as you can probably tell by the map, is used for that room that Madoka is currently inside of. And without any other items to pick up in here, we might as well go ahead and head up there and hopefully rescue our friend. <laughs> Though we do have one more, we do have this last ghostly apparition to get in here, though... Yet again, this seems to be a brand new entity that we have no real idea of what it is. Still, outside of that new vanishing ghost, we also find that it seems to have triggered some new item here in the case. and it's a portion of a black mask. Now, we don't have too much information on this mask. We do have some notes here from Dr. Dasso that talks about even though there are a number of masks and symbolic masks on the island, especially in regards to the lunar eclipse and things like that, there is a very particular mask called the Mask of the Lunar Eclipse that is both very special and very taboo in regards to the island's ideology. Dr. Oso never actually got a chance to see the mask, but he feels that it is somewhere on the island, and I get a very definite feeling that it seems not outside of coincidence that we get a reference to that mask and also a portion of a mask, so getting a feeling that this portion of the mask we found is going to be very important in the future. But you do want to be careful as you make your way back. There is a very tricky vanishing ghost set up here where there's not only a vanishing ghost on the floor, but there's also another version of that vanishing ghost we found earlier at the top of the stairs. So for some reason, Masaki might have some memory of this similar situation. We're not entirely sure, but... You know, that young girl ghost that we saw at the top of the stairs is definitely painted in a different light with this fallen girl at the bottom of the stairs. there another scared message from Madoka waiting for us on the intercom? <laughs> kind of. It, it's more of a, a trap to deal with this nurse yet again. Still no real difficulty. Especially since her attack patterns are pretty easy to get down. But even though that seems like it was a trap, we might as well go ahead and see what the message is waiting on the intercom here. Though it doesn't seem to be coming from Madoka's room at all. Hmm. 
Yeah, I guess, I guess that was just a trap. So with nothing else standing on our way, let's go ahead and see what is waiting for us in Madoka's room. It seems we have quite the artist on our hands in here. I know it's a bit hard to tell just what exactly is going on in any of these pictures. Hmm. Maybe some of these items laying around can fill us in a bit more on just Monica's state as a child. First thing we have here is a diary. Nothing too much we can garner from this outside of a seemingly innocuous childhood fear. Would seem innocuous if we didn't already get the overall impression that the distortion of a face and a loss of being wasn't a part of maybe something larger. We also see this initial mention of Ayako and maybe some friction between her and Madoka. Also in the box here, we get our first bit of Type 61 film. This is an upgrade from the Type 14 film, but Yet again, we're probably not going to be using it all that much, just because there isn't that much of it in the game. And on the desk here, we do find a letter to Madoka. This letter is from her mother, and it shows some genuine concern and caring for just Madoka's state of mind. I guess this loss of being and everything stretched even outside of being at this place, so I think she was interred here to hopefully get some treatment for that. And it's nice to show that there's no real darker side to Madoka's family. It's nice to see that general love and concern with all the deep dark rituals that we've seen throughout the Fatal Frame series. We also get a returning function from the previous Fatal Frame games. The measure function is not all that useful. It just shows the life for an uh, enemy that we are fighting. Also, it seems like something is interesting with this mirror here. sure what that was. Probably... It was probably nothing. Just the mind playing tricks on you. And hey, it's Madoka. Isn't it? That photo didn't really match up with what's sitting on the bed. Also seems a bit odd that Madoka doesn't seem to be moving. I definitely think something is playing tricks on our eyes, but might as well go ahead and check out what was left behind on the bed here. And it's a pretty disturbing nurse log in regards to Ayako. Seems that Ayako is pure and simple something of a sociopath, as for some reason she murdered the canary 
that Monica's mother had sent to her, decapitated it with a pair of scissors. And she was laughing all the time, bloodied and seemingly happy about the horrible mischief, as the nurse puts it. I think that stretches a little bit further than mischief. Also, mention that Ayako might have some distressing effects on the other children. Though I kind of feel that maybe it was this doll that was hidden away in their bedroom. I feel it's definitely a toss-up between the sociopathic child or the doll hidden away in the clock that maybe might have been having some bad influences on the other children. Still, though, with these larger pieces of artwork, we might get a little bit closer look into Madoka's mindset. Also, there are a few more red crystals here on the desk. Still not anything too useful with the limited amount of lenses we currently have, but... I don't know. I get a feeling that since Madoka isn't here and we've gotten so many mentions of Ayako, maybe that's the next place we need to go. Especially since I feel like maybe Ayako is a little bit closer than we might be anticipating. Still, her room isn't too far away, and I get a feeling we might be able to get inside. And the game is pretty apt in kind of reminding you just the direction you might need to be going. <laughs> Though I get the feeling the closer and closer we get to the Ayako's room, the less and less I think I really want to ever ever run into Ayako. Still, uh, I get the feeling we have no other choice of where we need to go right now, so let's check it out. Yeah, I'm getting the strong sensation that this is not a place we want to be. Yeah, Ayako is probably a lot more aggressive than anything we've run into so far. Though her pattern is somewhat slow, what makes her most dangerous is not only her aggression, but also the lack of telegraph in regards to her fatal frame opportunities. You'll see here that there is only a very, very small window to get them in. And even though if you do a max damage shot, it will knock her back, doesn't really do all that much damage with the Type 7 film. Still, even with her aggression, she is pretty slow all around. And once you do manage to get her fatal frames in, they do a tremendous amount of damage. Still, she is almost dead. 
though this won't be the end of her story. Thank you. 